All right guys, welcome back to a very special segment. This is actually a single watch authentication video. And it's not so much as a authentication as much as it is a review to a very, very special watch that I got to be lucky enough to get my hands on. And that is a yellow gold Rolex 6263, but it's not just any Rolex in yellow gold. And it's not just any specific Daytona in yellow gold. This is actually a 6263 in the earliest configuration possible. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. So as you guys know, Rolex launched uh, the 6263 reference right around 1971. So this Rolex would be considered the first true oyster case with the screw down pushers as well as the screw down crown. And also this watch had gotten upgrades from the previous generations to the now screw down pushers, the screw down crown. They got a little bit beefier case as well as a newer movement. More importantly, the 727 caliber was introduced which really improved the watch's overall functionality. It also improved the watch's reliability and timekeeping as the older generation movements were a little bit more problematic because those were known as 722s. Now you have the 727, which was also found in the transitional models, the 6262 and the 6264, proven to be a reliable workhorse for Rolex. They now introduced it solely into the 6263 line and the 6265 line, which carried all the way up until about 1987. Diving into this gold 6263, what is exactly so special about this watch? It is mainly the dial and the serial number range. If you guys do a quick research online, if you guys want to do some more deep reading, just simply Google 6263 three line in gold and you'll see what I'm talking about. So this specific watch came in for a client. This watch uh, is configured in a stainless steel configuration. So the dial is actually printed in a way that all the stainless steel dials are done. So if you notice the dial says Rolex Oyster Cosmograph. That is something that you would really only see in the stainless steel because the stainless steel models were not officially certified chronometers. And what that simply means is they were not certified with the extra timekeeping steps that Geneva would, you know, that Rolex would do through Geneva, through the International House of Watchmaking and so forth, where they would actually go the extra mile and they would actually certify the watch beyond just what Rolex released it for. So the tolerances were a little bit better on the gold watches because they had to leave the factory to very specific qualifications. What's really interesting is this watch was released in gold and it was not a certified chronometer. So it came out in 1971 to test the market and what they were trying to do is to see if, you know, how the market would adapt to a solid gold 6263. And when they realized it was gonna do well because people seem to have liked it, even though for that model, it wasn't particularly a great seller, they still decided to carry that line in solid gold. From what I've understood and what I've researched, there's only a very, very small handful of these available in the market. I believe they say roughly 10 to maybe 15 of these exist in the world with that dial configuration. So this is a really, really, really rare dog. And it's not something that, you know, you're going to see in the, you know, in a watch box anywhere you go, nor if you're even chasing vintage Rolex, this isn't something that would even really come up in the marketplace. These really only find their way through auction houses or very, very particular private sales. What's really cool about this watch overall is the warmth and feel of it. I mean, when you really look at this watch, it just has such a spectacular glow and overall feel. It's not even a heavy watch. It's very light in nature. You know, when you're handling something like this, you really get to see just how delicate these watches were. And you could really see how they withstood the you know the test of time and just overall how it's aged gracefully you know it's survived you know any type of wear and tear that would have caused damage throughout the years because this watch right here is in 100% original condition what I'm going to teach you today is to show you how to spot this watch as original. So the first thing at a glance you wanna look at, this is a 1971. If I pop the bracelet, these were only found in the 2.3 million serial range, which is correct. So the first thing I look for is the serial number, dates it to 1971. And here's a really interesting fact. While uh, that is something said about the dial, we can actually take this booklet right here and this is the booklet that it was uh, that it came with, which this booklet can only be found in 1971. And what's really, really interesting is this booklet actually showcases that dial. If you were to look at the next booklets after the year, after 1972, 1973, I'm gonna have to pull this up on my cell phone to show you guys, because this is what you would normally see in a certified chronometer and a, sol and a solid gold 6263, which you would typically see in a solid gold Rolex 6263 or 6265, same thing, we're just talking about different bezels here. 6263 in yellow gold would typically have the four line or the four line split, but this is a typical four line, which would normally say Rolex, Oyster, superlative chronometer which is the certified chronometer that it got 
you know, after the fact, officially certified. This watch is not a chronometer grade release, which is really, really interesting because Rolex would have only done that in gold. So uh, back in those times, your 6263 stainless steel was not a certified chronometer up until 1987. In 1988, when they introduced the 16520, they were all standardized to be certified chronometers. So it didn't matter if it came in gold or steel at that time. So this is a really interesting time in Rolex history where they would have seen this watch and they said it is not a certified chronometer. It is simply a 6263 in gold. Again, these are very, very, very limited watches. All the auction results for these watches have the serial number range that are within 10 to 100 digits apart. So this is really interesting. So of course I've researched the serial number on this watch to those of Christie's and Phillips and it seems to be consistent to what I'm finding. Now for privacy reasons, I'm not going to share the serial number, but it does have papers as well. So going back to what makes this a 6263 and how to spot the nuances with this watch. First thing I'm going to personally look at is a dial. Obviously discussing the dial, you guys see that it's got a really, really interesting layout. It's configured into stainless steel. So with first thing we would check if this was coming through the door is to make sure the serial number range is proper. The next thing we're going to look at are the hands just to make sure they look consistent. And as you can see, the chrono hand on these are solid black. So this is something that is consistent consistently found throughout uh, solid gold Daytonas in this era are the solid black chrono hands on the gold and then it would have a gold chrono hand on the black dial because again it's for visibility purposes they do that so you can see the contrast the next thing we're going to look at is the loom plots to make sure it's not missing any loom and from what i can see the dial is pretty pristine no missing loom plots checking the luminous material on the dial make sure it glows and it does. So these will actually glow for about a split second. And when you turn everything off, it kind of dies off pretty fast. Biggest and most important thing with these watches is not only does the dial need to make sense with the serial number range, but the biggest and most important factors are actually the stuff around the watch. This watch comes with a uh, Mark I bezel, which the way to identify it is you really wanna look at the eights. So the eight and 180 is gonna look like a snowman. And then you wanna look at the four too. Um, and this is something consistent with the stainless steel and the gold versions all have the same print. So they're gonna have the same layout. So I like to look at the, the number 140, 180. I'll pick a bunch of numbers, make sure they're consistent with what a Mark I is. So Mark I bezel here, again, you should look at the 140. There's actually a tail at the very top right corner of the letter, uh, the number four. That'll also be something that's really, really, really hard to replicate in an aftermarket bezel. Typically they don't have that tail. The units per hour, has that correct flat S. Again, that's another detail to look for in a Mark I bezel. If you guys at home wanna research this, just simply look up Rolex 6263 Mark I bezel. Those all came on the earlier 70s models. Up until about 74, 75, they started changing to the Mark IIs, the Mark Threes. And if you guys wanna learn the differences between those bezels, just simply go online and Google 6263 Mark I, Mark II, Mark III. There should be a list up there to kind of uh, help you guys along. And then the next thing about this watch would also makes it very, very unique. And, and also that is something featured on the very early 6263s is the pushers. So these aren't just your average pushers. These are in fact very, very, very expensive pushers off this watch. These pushers would go well into the $30,000, $40,000 territory simply because they are Mark Zero prototype pushers. They did not make these pushers very long until they went to the Mark I pushers, which are also known as P301s, and then they went all the way to the P302s, and then the service pushers, etc. These are very, very, very rare pushers. Uh, the fact that they're very intact and they look very, very good, and they seem to be in solid condition and one way to identify that is when you're looking at this pusher you'll notice that at the very end of it the type of knurling that the uh, screw down pusher has is very smooth it's just grooved in a way so that it you know it's just grippy enough but the later ones have more of a crowning these aren't very edge they're very flat and obviously the you know the bracelet correct for the era then one thing we look for is it's a 19 millimeter solid gold now the, the inconsistent part that I'll find a lot of these is the is the uh, end link numbers should be around a 60 a 50 57. These end link numbers are 57. You really commonly find the 57 end links on a date model, but they do crossbreed with the Daytona. So it's hard to say what it was actually born with because at the end of the day, this is a 51 year old watch that at some point in its life may have worn out a bracelet or the, you know, maybe back in the seven, in the early seventies, the user of this watch decided he wanted a oyster instead of the Jubilee or it came on leather. There's a lot of configurations this watch could have been born with. So it's hard to say what was actually born 
born with the watch without, you know, without seeing some type of receipt spelling it out. But yeah, which unfortunately not a lot of receipts uh, describe what the bracelets are. They just kind of, they're very vague. It just says one gold Rolex 6263, $599. <laughs> Retail price of this watch back in that time was roughly about 600 bucks. So you can only imagine, you know, how carefree people were when it came to information. They didn't really it didn't really register. It was just a gold watch. It is very much a collector's watch. Um, it is something that you can put away and stow away. It's in very, very, very excellent condition. Has this been polished at some point in its life? Yes. It's not truly unpolished, but it's not over polished. And that's the biggest thing we're going to look for in a uh, watch of this magnitude. You don't want to see something that's just been completely worked over where all the edges are completely soft. Even if that was the case, this watch is so rare that it might really overcome that. However, price would be punished to a degree for that. But otherwise, this is an excellent, excellent condition. I mean, they're a little soft, but other than that, it seems to be okay. The biggest thing to look for is the pushers aren't over polished. The crown is not over polished. And one thing you'll notice about this Rolex crown is that it doesn't have the two dots at the bottom of the crown because it was not watertight to that depth which those two dots i believe mean I believe the two dots indicate water depthness to about 660 feet this is only uh watertight to 330 feet i believe was the spec so it, i mean everything on the watch looks pretty good nothing looks to be replaced buckle is pretty nice it's obviously been polished you can see that some of the crown's been worn down a little bit but these coronets on these buckles stand up so high they can pretty much take a polishing <laughs> as many times as you can polish it but yeah, otherwise this is a uh, excellent watch and it's going to find its way into a collection and probably remain there for many many years so market value of these watches have been historically interesting some of these have sold throughout uh throughout in the past obviously when markets were really high i've seen sell prices to exceed four hundred thousand. there's no reason this can't be a five to six hundred thousand dollar watch one day simply because of the rarity this watch is far more rare than a gold Paul Newman but what's making what makes it less valuable is the pop culture that goes behind that Paul Newman is going to far exceed what this watch is this simply is just rare for for the dial layout but it is not going to be more expensive than a solid gold Paul Newman just for the sheer fact that it is not a Paul Newman it is the very first dial configuration set up for the gold 6263 so for the very first release of that watch this is a dial you would have got for it and again there's only so many many of these known to exist. I mean, according to what I've read, they say 10, but I probably, that's probably under estimated. I'm going to guess there's probably maybe double to triple that, but to be safe, again, even if it's only 30 units, that's insanely rare. Like that is just something you're not going to get your hands on very easily. So it's more who you know when you're looking for stuff, not what you know, because you really got to know where to, who, you know, you got to know the right people to find this type of stuff. If you guys are ever out there, you're looking for something crazy rare like this, I can help you with it. I do have the connections to find these type of watches. Privately found this watch through a seller and had a buyer for it. It's been a crazy journey with this watch. So glad we got it and glad I got to show it to you guys. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know in the comments below any more questions you might have about this watch or any other kind of questions about solid gold Daytonas from this segment. Let me know in the comments below what you guys would like to hear in the next segment.